the letter of Paul to the Galatians. We've reached chapter 2. We're going to read the first 10 verses together. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me. They gave me the right hand, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for uh, your word to us. And we Humbly ask, we beg of you, please uh, speak to us this evening. Uh, please take what I have prepared um, and blow away all of the, the stuff that might be unhelpful, uh, but cause uh, your precious seed to be planted deep in our hearts, that it might grow and bear fruit. Uh, Lord, we love your word, and we, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would apply it to us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. My message this evening is called uh, The Truth of the Gospel Preserved. And so one of the key things that Paul shows us in this letter to the Galatians is the vital importance of the truth of the gospel. The truth that we're saved by faith alone, without any contribution whatsoever from our works. We're, we're saved by the perfect merit of Christ's perfect righteousness, not, not our own righteousness, not the, the works that we do. It's Christ and Christ alone who sets us free. But in Galatia, the church is being attacked from within by false teachers who are trying to change the subject from Jesus' finished work to man's additional requirements. They were preaching really a non-gospel, a distortion, a corruption of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were teaching that you needed Jesus plus, that Jesus could get you most of the way there, but what you really needed to get all the way was circumcision and ceremonial law-keeping. But Paul insists that changing the subject from Jesus to man is really leaving Jesus altogether. So one of the ways that these false teachers were trying to bolster their message in the church in Galatia was by undermining the apostle Paul, by questioning his legitimacy even to be an apostle. After all, he, he wasn't one of the 12 who spent all those years with Jesus. Perhaps Paul did have no business teaching the gospel. And so Paul is concerned early on in, in this letter to establish and to defend his apostolic authority. He wants his hearers to know that the message he preaches is not man's gospel. 
You see that in chapter 1, verse 11, that he didn't receive it from any man, but through revelation directly from Jesus Christ. Verse 12. And not only was his gospel not from man, but his commission to be an apostle was also not from any man, not even another apostle. No, Paul received his commission directly from Jesus Christ. And he goes further, assuring the Galatians that he had been set apart before he'd even been born, that he was called by grace and commissioned to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ among the Gentiles. Verses 15 and 16 in chapter 1. So right from the beginning, Paul is really laying uh, the foundation of the truth that the gospel was never intended only for the Jews, but rather this good news was good news for the whole world. And so now in chapter 2, Paul continues to defend his ministry, although remember this, this is not so much a defense of his ministry as it is a defense of the true, pure gospel, a defense of that commission that he'd received from Jesus himself. And in the verses that we read together just now, I think we can see three ways that Paul makes this defense. So we're going to see first a gospel example gospel example, then second, apostolic affirmation, and then thirdly, gospel unity. Gospel example, apostolic affirmation, gospel unity. And so in these uh, opening verses, Paul continues his autobiographical accounts. You remember at the end of chapter 1, he'd uh, spoken of how he spent three years in the desert directly after his conversion, how he'd uh, gone briefly up to Jerusalem and met with Peter and James, and then he'd gone to work preaching the gospel in the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And really this whole time, he's, he's sort of unknown to the churches in Judea. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, we read, Then, after 14 years, I went, I went up again to Jerusalem. And we're going to let the scholars argue about whether those 14 years were 14 years from his first visit to Jerusalem, or 14 years from his conversion, or even possibly uh, 14 years from the ascension of Christ, as some might argue. But we'll let the scholars decide that. The point is, 14 years have passed. If Paul's commission relied on the authority of other men, don't you think he would have been up to Jerusalem much sooner? You see, Jerusalem was where Jesus' inner circle of disciples, the, the, the chief apostles, if you like, Peter, James, and John, Jerusalem was where they were based. And Paul saying, I didn't even go up to Jerusalem for 14 years. I didn't need to go to Jerusalem. Because it wasn't the apostles that gave me my ministry, it was Jesus Christ. And then notice also from verse 1, when Paul does go to Jerusalem, he takes with him Barnabas and Titus. Now remember, Paul's contention was that the gospel was for the whole world, not just the Jews, the whole world, including the Gentiles. And so Titus, Titus being with him, was really significant because Titus was a Greek, a Gentile. And what's more, he was uncircumcised. But vitally, and this is the point, Titus was a Christian. He was a believer. He looked to Jesus Christ for salvation. He was an uncircumcised Greek, Gentile believer. But he was, though, a gospel Example. He was a living, breathing illustration of the all sufficiency of Jesus Christ. But look at verse 3. Paul says, But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So the apostles in Jerusalem didn't require circumcision. And Paul himself did not allow Titus to be circumcised even though it seems like there was 
some pretty strong pressure from the Judaizers to have him circumcised. Verses 4 and 5, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment. These Judaizers, they seemed to follow Paul wherever he went. And this time Paul calls them false brothers, sham Christians, pseudo Christians, and they'd snuck into the church with the goal of bringing these new converts into slavery. They were, they were spying out the freedom that these believers had in Christ. But Paul and the faithful brethren there in Jerusalem don't allow them to get the upper hand even for a moment. See, these false brothers were teaching the same thing as the Judaizers in Galatia. They were saying, yes, believing in Jesus is good, but you need something more. You need to add the good work of circumcision. You can't be saved without it. They wanted to undo what Jesus had done in his finished work. They wanted to put a comma where God had put a full stop or a, a period. But Paul won't have this, not, not even for a moment. Why? Well, because his concern is that the truth of the gospel might be preserved. That's verse 5. And this was Paul's beating heart, that the truth of the gospel might be preserved, that the freedom that there is in Christ alone might be lifted high. But remember, remember who Paul was, though. He was, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. And you would have thought, if anyone would have been eager to see the ceremonial law fulfilled in every single jot and tittle, then it would have been Paul. And so Paul knows that Titus is now part of the covenant, part of the covenant of Abraham even, as we'll see later on in this letter. So why would Paul deny Titus the covenant sign? Well, I think because Paul knew that circumcision was a bloody sign. And he knew that all of the blood required had already been shed by the perfect Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. It wasn't marks on Titus's body that was going to save him. It was the bloody marks on Christ's body. And so the covenant sign now is bloodless. The covenant sign now is baptism, a, a washing with water. But more than this specific sign was the whole ceremonial law, which circumcision was just a part of. And the ceremonial law was always pointing forward to Jesus Christ, to the, to the perfect son, to the second Adam. And now Jesus had come. He had fulfilled all of the ceremonial law. There was nothing more required. Nothing more could be required. No one else could have done it but the Son of God. But he did. He did. All of the, the shadows of the ceremonial law found their fulfillment in him. And so Paul would later on write this in his letter to the Colossians. At Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, now that Christ had come, now that he had fulfilled the ceremonial law completely and fully, circumcision was done away with. And so Paul knew that if he allowed Titus to be circumcised, then he would have been consigning Titus and indeed himself and, and everybody else to the slavery of the law, to, to what uh, the, the AV translates letter in, uh, later on in the letter as the weak and beggarly elements. It would have been living as if Jesus had never come, as if his work was not entirely complete and entirely efficacious. But no, salvation was and is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, some of you who 
perhaps have, have read the book of Acts or remember it at least, there might be an objection forming in your mind. And you might be thinking, why on earth is this preacher going on and on about Paul not circumcising Titus when, in actual fact, he took Timothy and circumcised him? Why is he making such a fuss about not circumcising Titus when just a, a few moments later, it seems, he goes and circumcises Timothy? And if the, if the circumstances surrounding each of these events had been exactly the same, then you'd have a really strong point. But the circumstances were not the same. See, here with Titus, the Judaizers, these false brothers were demanding that believers be circumcised in order to be saved. They were making it a, an extra requirement of salvation. They were adding to the work of Christ, and Paul rightly shuts it down. But in the case of Timothy, no such requirement was even being suggested. That wasn't the conversation. See, Paul circumcised Timothy so that he might remove any offense from him, even in the minds of the Jews that they were going to minister to. Paul wanted to make sure that he did all that he could to remove any hindrance whatsoever to the gospel message that might have come from Timothy uh, remaining uncircumcised. See, the, the, the Jews that Paul and Timothy were going to, they might not have even heard what Timothy was saying if they knew that he was uncircumcised. So the two situations are, are radically different. But how do we, how do we apply all of this to our lives. We've said before, haven't we, that we're unlikely to face the same kind of pressure to be circumcised uh, that, that was going on in Galatia. But perhaps, perhaps we are tempted uh, to think that we need to add to the gospel, to, to supplement the work of Jesus Christ. And this might not be on the front end, as in adding a requirement to be saved or, or doing something to earn the love of God. But I think, I think we can, and many of us do, slip into a more subtle error. We find ourselves thinking that we need to do something in order to keep on in the love of God. We, we affirm completely and 100% that Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone, saves us, but now we think, now we're saved, we need to keep on working in order to maintain God's love and favor in our life. And this is, friends, this is where we need to fight to maintain the truth of the gospel. You see, all of the righteousness that we require has been earned for us by Christ and is imputed to our account. It's, it's just not possible to do enough good to earn your forgiveness. And it's not possible for you to do enough good to remain in your right standing with God. But the, the exquisitely good news of the gospel is that Christ has done all that is required. All that's required in perfectly keeping the law. All that is required for you to be forgiven. And all that is required for you to remain right with God forever. See, we have a glorious, glorious gospel. And we need to fight to maintain the truth of this gospel. We've got to resist the devil's lies, resist the world's lies. Christ is all, all that you will ever need, all that you can ever enjoy. But I think these verses also here at the beginning of chapter 2 should cause us to, to examine ourselves. How do we live in the light of the gospel? You see, how you live helps you to see more clearly what you really believe. So, for example, when you sin, and you will, when you sin, what thoughts flood into your mind about God? Do you, do you believe that you have to clean yourself up before going to him for forgiveness? Or do you run to him with, 
conviction in your heart and cling to Christ's righteousness alone? Or what about when others sin? What thoughts flood into your mind about God then? Do you believe that they too can find freedom in Christ? Or are you secretly holding them to some other external standard? In other words, is God's grace sufficient for you in both what you believe and how you live? Are you believing the gospel for yourself and for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, the second part of Paul's defense is his retelling of the apostolic affirmation that he received while he was in Jerusalem. And there are four things that Paul mentions in these verses that show that the apostles in Jerusalem affirmed Paul's message. We've already seen the first one. They didn't force Titus to be circumcised. They affirmed that Christ was all that mattered. The gospel was Christ alone plus nothing, not even circumcision. So that was the first thing. The second thing comes in verse 6. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. And so at first, when we're reading this, in English at least, it, it seems like a kind of dismissive thing for, for Paul to have said. But that's not what's going on here. Paul isn't being dismissive here. He's not downplaying anyone's importance. He's, he's merely pointing out that God's grace levels all of us. And so it doesn't matter who Paul and uh, who Peter and James and John once were. All that matters is the gospel, the message that they proclaim. And that message is the same gospel that Paul proclaims. So he's not intimidated by their status because they stand together. They're on the same team. They're standing as one who, who's preaching the, the only good news that can save sinners. And then, he, then Paul says, he, they, they, that's Peter, James, and John, they added nothing. They added nothing. And so he doesn't mean by that that they contributed nothing to the effort of the church. No, far, far from it. What he means by saying that is that they added nothing to his message. They added nothing to the message of Paul. The Jerusalem apostles found nothing lacking in Paul's message. They didn't need to add anything to it. Well, the third sign of their affirmation of Paul's ministry is in verse 7. And here we have pretty explicitly, I think, the fact that Paul and the Jerusalem apostles preached the same gospel message. Paul is entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. And here in verse 7, in the, in the original Greek, the word for, for gospel is actually only used once. And I think this just strengthens the emphasis that they both preached the same gospel the glorious gospel of grace, the, the gospel that says Jesus Christ came into this broken world to seek and to save that which was lost, that he lived a life that fulfilled the law completely, a life of perfect obedience that we should have lived, a gospel that tells us that he died in agony on a cruel Roman cross, suffering the, the punishment that our sin deserved, the gospel that tells us that he rose again on the third day from the dead in victory, triumphing once and for all over sin and death, proving that his sacrifice was accepted by God the Father. The gospel that tells us that he ascended into heaven and is now ever interceding for his own people. The gospel that tells us that Jesus Christ is our victorious older brother, our sympathetic high priest, and our loving heavenly advocate. The apostles in Jerusalem affirmed Paul's message because it was the same message that they preached. It was the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And verse 8 shows us that it, it was the same Holy Spirit who gave power and unction to both Paul and the Jerusalem apostles. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, that's to the Jews, worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. 
And notice here, Paul's ministry is an apostolic ministry, just as Peter's was. The fourth sign in verse 9, the Jerusalem apostles extended the right hand of fellowship to Paul and Barnabas. And I think almost certainly to Titus as well, although he's not mentioned here. They acknowledged publicly their union, their commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so back home in England, in the, in the church that uh, our family was a part of, there was a tradition of uh, welcoming new members into the church and offering to them the right hand of fellowship. And so the elders would come and shake hands with the new members publicly in front of the whole church. It was a, a visible sign of our fellowship and unity, our togetherness in the gospel. So the Jerusalem apostles affirmed Paul's message and his apostolic authority. Paul had not been running in vain. So how do we apply this to our own lives? Well, first I think we need to see the great comfort that there is in these verses. It should move us to, to real, deep thanksgiving. Because, friends, here the gospel of grace was preserved. Nothing was added to Paul's message. No works, no extra ceremony, just pure, white-hot gospel. So we can thank God from the bottom of our hearts for this interaction here in Jerusalem. We can thank God that there he established the true gospel, that a false gospel wasn't allowed to creep in. A false gospel wasn't allowed to prevail. But then also I think we need to hear the rebuke in these verses. They, they admonish us for thinking that our ministry is something that we do for God, something that, God forbid, we can take credit for. Beloved, our, all of our ministry, wh whatever it is, where, wherever it takes place, I, in the home, in the workplace, in the public square, in the church, all of gospel's ministry is God's work done through us. God's work done through us. Ministry is far closer to, uh, to a stewardship than it is to a career or, or a job. So think about it. The, the all-holy, almighty God entrusts his worldwide salvation project to a bunch of fallen, sinful men and women with limitations and weaknesses and inadequacies. Does, does that sound like a, a good idea to you? Does that sound like a plan that's going to be successful? Of course not. But that's how God works. He saves people through the finished work of Christ on the cross and in resurrection power places himself within their hearts in the person of the Holy Spirit and commissions them to go to the ends of the earth. He takes messed up people, washes them in the blood of Christ and sends them out for his glory. That's the God that we serve. Gospel ministry is not our work done for God. It's God's work done through us. And therefore, it's God who should get all the glory. Well, finally, Paul points out the gospel unity that exists with him and the Jerusalem apostles, verses 9 and 10. Indeed, this is the, the gospel unity that brings together every true believer. The, the gospel unity, uh, the the unity that we have in the gospel, I should say, is an unbreakable bond. We're joined together in Christ, invincibly. And so the right hand of fellowship that we see there in verse 9 is a, is a beautiful, visible picture of this unity. And here in these verses at the end of our section, we see unity of purpose. The, the purpose of bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Paul was to go to the Gentiles. Peter was to go to the Jews. And in verse 10, we see a unity of passion. Both Paul and Peter were eager to look after the poor. And the poor here are, are certainly the materially poor. Uh, James would write later 
religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. But I think also on a deeper level, they were to remember the spiritually poor, to be committed to reaching out with the only hope for a broken and sin-ruined world, to proclaim the gospel of free grace in Jesus Christ. So what's the application for us here from these concluding verses? Well, first we need to be committed, committed to the proclamation of the gospel. We need to put our hands and our wallets where our mouths are to give of our time and resources for the furtherance of God's kingdom, to, to joyfully support every faithful gospel ministry that we can. Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is faithfully preached, that is cause for rejoicing. That is cause for us to offer whatever support we can. We might not always be able to give financially. We might not always be able to give of our time to support that ministry, but, but all of us, all of us can pray. I wonder if this gospel mission is high on your own prayer list. Are you praying regularly for the gospel ministry of this church, for our preachers and teachers, for the co-op and youth ministries, for evangelism? Are you praying for our covenant children that they might come to repentance and faith? Are you praying for your wider unbelieving family and friends. I urge you this evening, be committed to praying for the work of the gospel wherever it takes place. And then finally, if you know this evening that you're currently outside of Jesus Christ, you know you're not trusting him, then you need to know that you are poor. You're in the deepest need of that you could possibly be. You are without a savior, without a mediator. And one day you'll have to stand alone before the omniscient, eternal God who sees right into your heart, who knows every thought that you've ever had, every action you've ever done. Friend, if that's you, you need the glorious grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need the cleansing power of his blood. And so turn to him this evening. Confess your sin. Put your trust in him. He is able to save you. His righteousness can be freely given to you. Your sin can be taken from you and removed as far as the east is from the west. You don't have to stand alone in that terrifying day of judgment. You can have Christ as your Lord, as your advocate, one who speaks for you as your protector, as your savior. And so run to him, cry out to him. He is the only one who can save you. Amen.